Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Adam Ward. I'm uh, here hosting a, we are hosting sort of a series of weekly webinars around online education for our community. Um, goals are to help us to help us all learn about different tools and resources that might be out there to improve the way we're teaching online. Uh, and frankly, just to build some community and know that we're not alone with the things we're struggling with um, and to learn from one another. Um, so the format for today, um, today will sort of happen in three parts. Um, in the first, uh, we've got two presenters. Um, so Imad Habib and Billy's Lane, and I'll introduce them with a bit more detail in a moment. They'll talk to us about HydroLearn um, and that'll take the first third or so of our hour. Um, then we'll open it up to questions for those two about HydroLearn specifically, um, how you can use the modules, how you can get involved. Uh, and then with any time we have after that, um, we'll open it up to just a broader discussion about how our online education is going. Um, there's really no agenda there. Last week we ended up um, spending a, a lot of time talking about office hours and strategies to meet one-on-one -on -one with students. And we'll see where the conversation goes today. Um, just a couple of business items before we get started. Um, this is our second webinar at this noon to 1 p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern time. Uh, in the next two weeks, um, we'll have two more panel discussions. Uh, next week, um, Skylar Herzog and I will be hosting a group of graduate students to give us the real deal of what it was like from their side in this transition. Um, and they'll both share what has gone well and could be better in their view. Um, and then that panel will be open for instructors to actually talk to graduate students about how their classroom experience went, how their mentoring is going with their PIs. Um, and the following week, we'll do the same with an undergraduate panel. So if you are a graduate student or undergraduate and you're excited about potentially being a panelist, um, please reach out to me. I'll drop my email in the chat box in just a moment. Um, and we'll happily have you join our panel. And if you're here um, attending the meeting today, uh, in those next couple of weeks, we'll be providing you the chance to get honest feedback from students um, who are not in your class and not subject to the grade that you're assigning uh, about what they've liked and not what they've struggled with. Um, so that's what's coming up in the next two weeks. Um, finally, if you were on with us um, for some of our past meetings, we were using the Zoom uh, Q&A function. Um, I just want to note that uh, we've removed that function today because we had some, uh, some Zoom bombing issues uh, and there's limitations to what content we can delete and how we can lock things down. Um, so if you've got questions out there and you want to type them in, um, you can type them into the chat box. They'll come to the panel. And then after we make sure that they are appropriate content, we will, paste, we will send them back out so everybody can see your comment. Um, so those of you in attendance can feel free to type questions in that way. Uh, and as we get to the Q&A section, um, we're also quite excited to have you join us in sharing your answers. Um, and so uh, Julie uh, from Quasi, Julia, excuse me, can um, add you to our panel so that you can turn on your video, turn on your mic and contribute to the discussion. And so if you'd like to do that, just let us know in the chat box, you've got a question you'd like to ask uh, live and, and we will do that. All right, <sighs> that's class business for the day. Um, so, so now let's get to it. Um, so two panelists uh, that I'm really excited uh, agreed to spend their time with us this Friday uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, so first is Imad Habib, and Imad is uh, the lead PI for the HydroLearn project that you'll be learning about today. Uh, and Belize Lane is here. She was one of the first HydroLearn fellows um, who developed some modules on that platform and has taught with them in the classroom. And so uh, with that, Imad, I'll turn it over to you and you should be able to uh, unmute, share your screen, and yeah, we'll look forward to learning more about HydroLearn. Thank you. Uh, so you are muted at the moment, Imad. Yep, okay. there you go. So now we learned that Adam controls who can speak and who cannot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you, Quasi, for, uh, for the opportunity to participate in these panels. 
Um, I think I uh, participated in an early one about um, maybe several weeks ago that was also put together by Adam. So um, uh, hopefully there's not a whole lot of petition between uh, that one and today. What we want to do today is really to um, give you a bit more detailed information about the resources that we have on the hardware platform and how these can help you um, um, uh, with, with your teaching. Um, so I'll share some slides here and I'll also be using the website itself where we have the resources hosted. Uh, this way you can follow along. Um, so let me see. Okay, can you all see my desktop now? I think. Okay, okay so um, 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 we basically want to give you an idea about uh, what um, you as an instructor can do with HydroLearn. And I'll share with you briefly um, um, the design approach that, that we are uh, using to develop these modules, uh, whether the development team of the project or the collaborators who work with us. And this is a very critical component of our project to ensure the uh, validity and uh, of the, um, of the um, modules that we, we uh, develop. Uh, so, um, Okay. So, and then I'll show you some examples of um, modules that we have on either learn just to give you an idea of uh, what they look like and um, um, what they uh, include. And um, I'm, I'm very excited to have Belize um, uh, from New York State University uh, who worked with us as, um, she's not part of the project officially, she's actually uh, working with us as a fellow. We have a fellowship program in either learn to engage the community to basically develop these modules because it's not just about um, our uh, project, you know, staff who, who's, uh, who's developing this. We want the community to, uh, I think Adam made a good point that this is all about building the community. So we, want, we would like to contribute to that. So, um, and then if time permits, we can also show you some uh, brief introduction on how you can actually adapt or modify existing modules uh, on how to learn um, if that's something that you would be interested in. Um, uh, I also, you know, acknowledge the, the support from uh, my colleagues at uh, Utah State and BYU and uh, University of Maine um, uh, for, for their work on this project. Um, so before I get started, you know, just a brief background on how to learn in general. It's, it's a project that actually we have been working on for the last several years with support from uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, um, very, uh, very um, much appreciated. Uh, we have been working on it since 2008, actually, so uh, quite a bit of effort and quite a bit of support from NSF. Um, the, um, our main objective is primarily to uh, promote the collaborative development and adoption of um, active learning resources in uh, hydrology and water resources. And uh, we really look at uh, HydroLearn to, um, as a place where the community can work together in the development of uh, online hydrologic uh, engineering, uh, sorry, education content. So um, jumping into um, uh, the next part here is uh, what, what can you really do with HydroLearn and what does HydroLearn have to, to offer? Um, so um, let's see if I can advance this, right. So uh, as an instructor, there are a couple ways you can actually interact with HydroLearn. Uh, you can use it uh, to find content that was developed by others and that, that may already uh, suit your needs for your class. And in that case, you can actually use the modules as is and assign them to your students uh, to cover topics that you already have in your uh, curriculum or to supplement what you typically cover with um, some additional uh, student activities. Um, so you can basically find modules that are designed around authentic um, learning uh, authentic problems. Um, they typically integrate uh, hydrologic data and modeling resources, and they're also driven by a clear learning objective that um, uh, brings students into uh, rich uh, activities. Um, and of course, the modules also come with um, assessment tools and rubrics that can uh, help the instructors grade uh, these assignments. Uh, so these are some of the elements that we found over the years to be most helpful for folks who use these kind of resources. And um, we try to, uh, to build the modules to contain these elements to facilitate the adoption by, by others. Um, the idea is that you want to have a module that is usable by others beyond your own immediate use in your own class. Uh, besides using HydroLearn to find resources and use them uh, off the shelf, if you speak, 
Um, another way to uh, interact with how to learn is basically to adapt an existing module and um, that was created by somebody else. Uh, you can actually clone that module and um, um, modify it to suit your own uh, needs. You can make it shorter, you can make additional, you can add additional maybe exercises or replace some of the data sets or the watershed location that you are um, interested in. Uh, you can also use how to learn to collaborate with others, uh, whether within your own university or even better outside, um, to develop uh, uh, learning uh, modules. And um, uh, for that, um, to support that kind of uh, user uh, scenario, uh, we build into how to learn some tools um, that can um, support the developers of modules on um, developing learning outcomes and um, learning um, activities and, and, and what have you. Um, we, we really think that in this time, this interesting time, that um, the learning resources that Tidal Learn has um, will support uh, the increased uh, focus on um, um, online education and um, uh, probably also will help us uh, in the transition back to the uh, in-class learning uh, by trying to harness uh, some of the ongoing efforts uh, to develop effective uh, uh, teaching resources. We actually have a, um, an open call for participation uh, for uh, folks who are interested to work with us during um, the summer to develop some learning modules and we have a fellowship program. Like I said, Belize is one of the early ones that work with us. Uh, if you are interested more to know about that, you know, there's a link on the website that uh, tells you how to apply. Um, and it, you can always contact me if you have any questions. Um, so um, before I show you some of the modules that we have on how to learn, um, I would like to share with you a little bit more on the uh, research background that we have, uh, um, that we use to build the modules with, uh, using this concept of constructive alignment. And uh, without getting into too much details into this, but basically constructive alignment is, is about aligning the learning objectives that you want your students to achieve out of the module or out of the uh, content and then building the instruction that will uh, allow the students to learn or achieve these uh, uh, learning objectives and uh, having some assessment tools that will tell you whether actually the students have learned what they are supposed to learn. So it's like, it's like a triangle with the students in the center of it. Um, and it's an iterative process where you define your learning objectives, you build the content uh, to deliver that uh, learning objective and then measure whether the students have actually learned it or not. And uh, you can improve that cycle um, as you go. Um, so we try to enforce uh, or at least promote this uh, approach uh, in developing uh, the, the modules that we have on uh, hardware learn. Um, the, um, we believe this is a good practice to ensure that the modules will have um, a real value in delivering the learning objectives and it will also help um, the instructor in keeping track of what they are trying to achieve and whether the students actually were able to achieve it or not. Um, so without um, spending too much time on, on the theory here, uh, you know, maybe I uh, can show uh, you some of the um, results, some of the modules that we have on, on Hydro Learn. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I think maybe the best way to do that is to uh, really jump into the website. Um, so I'm going to exit the PowerPoint presentation here. Hopefully everything will work. Um, this is... Um, this is the site that we have here. Um, let me know if you cannot see the web page. You should be seeing the web page now, actually. And um, so, okay, so this is the web, the, the home page, and you, you can browse there through the modules. It will take you to this um, page here. Uh, if you are not log logged in, it will ask you to log in. Registration, of course, is is free, and you know it's just a way for us to to um, provide access to proper uh, users. Uh, this is the list of uh, resources we have. We currently have about 15 modules or courses, if you want to call them that way. These are the ones that are have been finished and developed already, but we have a group of fellows uh, who are working um, actively on developing other, um, other uh, modules um, that cover different topics here. So uh, the ones that we currently have, um, uh, they, um, they actually have been curated and tested and used in classrooms. 
and uh, like I said, they come with uh, student-oriented learning activities and assessment uh, rubrics. Um, the, um, we have several modules here that focus on fundamental topics in hydrology and uh, water resources engineering. Uh, some, on, some are on emerging topics um, such as um, climate uh, variability and climate interconnections, some on issues like uh, energy and water nexus, and some on very traditional um, problems that we all teach uh, in hydrology and water resources classes, um, including um, you know, uh, infiltration, uh, design storms, uh, uh, just the rainfall runoff processes altogether, uh, flood prediction and flood protection uh, design. And um, some of these modules are pretty comprehensive and uh, can occupy a fairly uh, good part of your semester. Um, and some of them are actually um, more, more, more small in size and they focus on a single topic. Uh, for example, this one here talks about how you develop uh, routing, basically, uh, routing of inflow and outflow hydrographs. Uh, another smaller module talks about um, um, design storms and how can you construct a, a design storm with a certain frequency and certain duration. So it, it, we have a mix of, of topics and really uh, the best way is to kind of just uh, look at them and see which ones will, will help you and which ones will um, become uh, suitable for your, uh, for your class. Um, like I said, some of the modules are, are small and can be finished in a week or two. And um, it takes a student only about a few hours. You know, we try to keep track of the hours here uh, on each of them. Um, you, know, um, you know, I have a, a good colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Clint Wilson, you know, he used several of these smaller uh, modules um, and assigned them as independent assignments to, to their student, his students in the senior design class. He wants just basically to bring everybody up to speed before, they give him, before, before he gives them the senior design project. Um, another uh, colleague also who, uh, Dr. Courtney DiVittorio from uh, Wake Forest, uh, she used one of the modules, uh, the, the, the longer one, you know, this one here that talks about design of a storm detention basin. Uh, I'm going to show some details of that, but she used this module to cover a good part of her course. She was uh, teaching that course for the first time and uh, she used the module and she actually ended up adding to it and modifying, you know, the content which really made the module a, a lot better. So it's a good case of how, how uh, working or collaborating on these uh, modules can actually produce a, a lot better than if uh, everyone uh, works on them separately. Um, um, yeah, one thing to share here is, is that a lot of these modules actually can be used in asynchronous, uh, asynchronous delivery. Um, maybe that's, that's a better way for um, online delivery. And um, you can assign these modules to your students and to complete and um, on their own and uh, finish you know, prior to your virtual meeting with them and uh, have them submit the assignment uh, or the results ahead of time and then use the virtual time to, um, to uh, discuss results or uh, go over uh, discussions with them. Um, um, so uh, maybe again, you know, before I turn it to Belize to show us uh, her specific module, I will um, uh, show some very quick um, uh, glimpse into what some of these modules uh, look like. Um, I'm going to uh, maybe use this one here, um, and um, it will take you to, to this uh, about page, uh, and you can uh, get into the course here. This is an outline of the course. Basically, this is um, about a, most of the modules are focused around solving a certain problem. So this module here talks about how can you design a detention basin uh, for flood protection in a specific watershed. Um, and um, the, the, this is one of the longer modules actually goes through the entire process of starting from uh, your watershed and precipitation analysis, um, calculation runoff and infiltration, routing the hydrographs, and um, then they actually do all of that manually, so to speak, or with Excel, and they come back at the end and do uh, the analysis with a uh, modeling uh, package here with HMS. So um, again, very quickly here, it will start with listing what are the learning objectives that, that you expect the students to learn uh, from this. You know, so it's, uh, the learning objectives are designed uh, for each section. Um, this is good for the student and good for the instructor uh, to be able to communicate it upfront. And, um, uh, and then it walks them through the different uh, parts of the, of the module 
Um, for example, here it talks about the watershed first. They have to go through the watershed. Uh, and there are some uh, uh, maybe quizzes that they have to do to complete uh, after they study the watershed. There are a couple learning activities here. I believe this one here deals with um, delineating the watershed. So it introduces some tools on how you can delineate the watershed. It has a rubric, right? So this is a learning activity that you will grade the students uh, with. Uh, so it has a rubric. Again, this is very important for the student to see upfront as they work through the assignment. And then uh, it continues with the instructions on how the student can actually uh, complete that assignment. So some of the assignments are very detailed and could be long. Um, and uh, when they finish or somehow sometime along the way, it uh, gives them like a checking in type, you know, to see, make sure that to make sure that they are on the right track. So the students will click here and, and see if, if they are on the right track or not. So it gives them some intermediate feedback, feedback to see if they are on the right track or not before the error starts to, to build up. And then that's the learning activity will close with some uh, summary questions or some census, synthesis questions to make the students think about the results and discuss them, discuss uncertainty, uncertainty discuss the implications, you know, to make them think beyond just producing the numbers. Um, so that's just an example of what the, a learning activity will look like. And then the module continues with the rest of the, of the sections there. Um, it could take them through the precept analysis, they design a storm um, using whatever methods, you know, alternating block methods or what have you. So every section will have an introduction or a background, maybe a quiz and a learning activity that asks the students to do something. Uh, so it, it adopts this active learning approach. Uh, it goes after that into runoff and infiltration. They learn about soil and runoff generation mechanisms and um, then routing after that. Again, there's quite a bit of rich uh, assignments that, um, for example, this one is on uh, reservoir uh, hydrologic routing, uh, designing a detention basin, sizing it up and um, uh, looking at um, you know, trade-offs between the size of the reservoir and the cost and other environmental factors. And then when, once they develop all of that, um, um, you know, sometimes the, the module will actually provide them with templates on, to get them started. You know, this is intended mostly for undergrad education or for maybe early graduate if uh, some other modules are like that. Uh, so it, it's always good to help the, the student um, you know, uh, with a little bit of um, initial help. So we give them some Excel templates to complete or to see how the calculations will go. Um, and um, at this module here at the end, it closes with uh, a modeling exercise with HMS, where they basically do everything that they did uh, previously, but they do it using HMS. So it's a great learning experience. I believe a lot of our students actually um, um, give us uh, good feedback, especially when they graduate, they come back and say, you know, this type of, uh, of exercise or this type of analysis, you know, helped me a great deal because it was a real problem and it also used some of the, the standard tools that the industry uh, uses. The modules also, the, or the, the, the platform allows you to integrate some of the uh, external tools inside the platform. So this way the student has, has, uh, gets exposed to these uh, tools or sites or data sets but also it's embedded within the platform so that the student does not get lost really on where to find them. So you'll find that we were able to put here a Google map for the student to, to navigate and find out where the watershed is. And, um, you know, this is the tool, one of the tools that we use for delineation. You know, if you're familiar with uh, Model My Watershed, it's really a nice tool that people use. Um, so the students will use these tools while they are doing the exercise. Um, again, this is the site from the NOAA. Of course, they can visit the site uh, um, on their own, but we bring it here so that it's all integrated in one place. Um, so um, by the end of the, of the exercise, or the end of the module, the students learn the material. They um, applied it uh, using um, manual calculations or Excel, and they also got exposed to some modeling experience and a lot of data analysis. And also they learned about some of the uh, research or industry uh, tools and data sets. Um, this is an example of one of the modules and um, like I said, you know, uh, other modules follow a very similar strategy. Uh, we have here another module, a popular one on energy and water nexus. Um, this one is, is, has also been popular with different folks. Uh, it goes through the 
analysis of water stress and water usability um, um, and um, opportunities to alleviate you know um, stress on the water system and it gets also into um, uh, impact of the energy generation on the water system so we, we developed this with a supplement grant from NSF on the energy water uh, food nexus uh, a nice tool that this uh, this course here or this module has is this uh, portal that allows them to interact with a lot of uh, data sets um, on um, the water sector and the energy sector, whether it's a power plant or um, uh, so you can you can do a lot of interesting analysis here. You can look at you know state by state, um, and um, you can look at a list of variables, whether it's the mean annual flow, surface water consumption by different sectors, or groundwater uh, also uh, consumption by different sectors, and calculate water stresses and so forth. So it's it's pretty rich um, um, uh, module that that walks them through the concept of water stress and how um, the water system is stressed by different uh, sectors, whether it's ag or whether it's energy. And um, you can do all sorts of manipulation to the data. You can download the data and do some external assignments on it. And the module walks them through that. Um, so um, I guess uh, I, I um, just want to give you a quick, a quick um, um, uh, impression on what, what these modules look like. Um, if you can use them as they are, like you don't have to modify anything, you can just basically um, assign them to the students in your class. But if you are, um, if you want, you can almost uh, duplicate that course that becomes yours, and then you can start modifying it on the platform here. Uh, so it has a studio uh, part, the platform has a studio part, and you can basically, you know, uh, modify anything you want here, whether it's a learning objective, whether it's an activity, or add a graph, or you know, uh, just like we do with, with most of the uh, learning management systems. So it has that other parallel use if you want really to modify things there and start building your own things or, or customize existing activities. So um, I think that's what I really want to show you as far as these modules. I would like to turn it over to Belize. Uh, like I said, Belize is one of our uh, fellows um, um, that we uh, recruited to work with us on the project. And she has an interesting, um, actually all the modules that we have from the fellows are really exciting because they bring different, um, different um, uh, elements. Um, this is a, a quick map of the current fellows that we have. I think we have more than that now. And they bring different um, aspects, different topics that they want to work on um, from hydrogeology to you know, the module of physical hydrology, that's what Belize will present. Um, and uh, so uh, this is really a, a exciting um, aspect of the project is to be able to work with all these different uh, faculty across the country and um, and uh, bring rich modules that represent different um, different sectors of, of the community. Um, Belize, like I said, has a very interesting um, uh, module that she developed and uh, she used some uh, different tools uh, that uh, primarily interact with some of the resources on Quasi and HydroShare, and she was able to integrate those within HydroLearn, and I thought uh, it would be a good uh, idea for, uh, for us uh, to hear from her directly. Uh, sorry if I took a lot of time, uh, but Belize, uh, I'll turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing, and then you can share on your end. Can you guys hear me now? I'm trying to start my video, but it's not allowing me to. There we go. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share some of the work that I've been doing. I've had a really great experience working with um, Ahmad and Melissa and the other folks as part of the HydroLearn team. And if you can all see my screen now, I'm just showing you this physical hydrology module that I developed as part of my 
first year graduate course in physical hydrology as part of the civil and environmental engineering graduate program at Utah State. Um, so I just want to point out that this is, Iman mentioned that some of these are just could be done in a couple of days and some are more comprehensive. This essentially captures all of the exercises for my entire semester course, uh, ranging from hydrologic data analysis and conservation laws to soil properties, uh, infiltration modeling, and the climate system. But what I wanted to show you all briefly today is an example of how um, we linked the HydroLearn software with uh, HydroShare resources and specifically Python Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to go ahead and start this course or this specific section within the module. And let me know if you guys are able to see this. So the very basic, you come in and as Imad said, you have your learning objectives here listed out. In this case, the focus is on deriving hydrologically useful information from digital elevation models, describing the steps involved in mapping stream networks, and then using that information to answer some questions. So what HydroLearn offers us here is the, uh, the organized setup for explaining the introduction, what we want the results to look like, um, and the link in this case to, so some of the background in this case, we're focusing on the Logan River catchment, which is just draining into Utah State University area here in Logan. And in this case, what we did is we embedded an iframe so that we can link directly to this HydroShare resource. So it walks you through, basically what you need to do is say, open with, and you're gonna open with the quasi Jupyter notebook or Jupyter Hub. And we'll see if it works because I already have one loaded up. And again, all of this information is described in detail, even to the extent where we were able to upload a video here showing exactly how you, where you click and how you actually come in and open it if students are confused. So just to clarify everything there. So I come in here and I have all of the resources stored on HydroShare, including all of the data sets that are included in this resource. And I click on my Jupyter Notebook and I already have it open here, so I'm gonna come over here. And so what I ended up doing was trying to link these two resources. So over here I have a Jupyter Notebook that has markdown cells where we have text. So this is essentially a standalone, can be used as a standalone document. It walks through all the key concepts, but the expectation is for the student to actually use these side by side. So I can pull my workbook over here. So I have my dynamic workbook, which is simultaneously showing how to work in Python and how to go through this exercise in a more applied sense. And so what we get, and you know, we have the rubric over here. So students have the sense of exactly what the expectations are for their course. And if I move on to the next section, this is gonna explain exactly what is available in this HydroShare resource, what the outcome from this first exercise should look like, and an introduction to all these key functions and tools. Because again, we're really gonna, the students are really gonna get in the weeds here. As you see, when we move through this Jupyter Notebook, there's a lot of detail here. So they can run it line by line, but the hope is that by having all of the detailed information here, or having enough information here that they can follow along in their Jupyter Notebook, and then having the context stored over here in HydroLearn, they can really actually not just get into the clicking through mindlessly, but they're actually forced to ask a series of questions. So again, here we have embedded a lot of the data sets or links to the resources that they're gonna lead. So here's the USGS gauge, and then all the summary questions are over here. So they know that they're gonna to have to use this Jupyter Notebook to address these summary questions, like what is the projection of the outlet? What are the max and min elevations? And so as you walk through over here, the student can actually run this code and take a look at the results line by line. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna open this up in a,
format here so we can see this. So again, you come in, you link to the HydroShare resource, you can open up your Jupyter Notebook, and then the Jupyter Notebook allows you to run the code one line at a time, providing the basic context and then the code. In some cases, the students are asked to actually adapt the code. And what you'll see is that these are intended to be used in parallel. So you're walking through HydroLearn where the student has more information related to the rubric, the summary questions, the expectations, and a lot more of the context, um, essentially a, a small textbook over here. And then Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebook is where they're actually performing their analyses. And they can make sure that what they're doing is actually reflecting what is expected of them. So here's just another example. Now they're performing the pit removal and flow direction analysis using the TAUDEM tools. And then over on the right, you're seeing where they're actually working through um, and running those lines of code to accomplish that. So that, um, I'll leave it there so we have time for discussion, unless anyone has additional questions or things they'd like to see. So thanks, um, thanks Belize and Ahmad for, um, for doing this. Um, so just a couple of quick, I answered a couple of questions on your behalf uh, while you guys were presenting. Um, both of which were broadly around the like, how do I get this? I want this. What does it cost? Um, and so just to, to reassure everybody this, uh, you know, your, your tax dollars are funding this, right? This is an NSF supported project. It's, it's entirely open. Um, you will register at HydroLearn. Um, but then you and your students can access all of these resources absolutely free of cost. Um, and yeah, so that was the sort of the spirit of the first couple of questions were just like, where do I find it? I want it. Um, and I've got a few more questions I saw come in along the way. Um, before I do those, uh, I just want to note, um, so I'm, I'm new to the HydroLearn ecosystem. Um, and uh, what I thought was really neat is that um, there's a whole range of modules out there in terms of how long they are. Some are really short, like you might assign it as part of a homework assignment or, hey, we had to cancel class on Tuesday, please work through this module instead. Some are much more comprehensive. Um, what Belize showed us is one of the really high-end integrations. So it's got like all of these live, the live script and the coding and students are really in it doing it. Um, other modules are a lot more um, sort of one-way presentation and don't necessarily have all of those interactions there. So there's a real diversity of content on HydroLearn. Um, okay, so then my job is supposed to be to, to MC this thing. Um, so let's see. So Molly McAllister, I've seen two questions come in from Molly. Um, the one that just came in a moment ago, she asked, do you have to be affiliated with a university? So could people in industry use this? Um, Imad, I, do you want to just let sure. us? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, of course it's primarily universities because the primary users will be universities because you know we teach, right? But we would like to, I mean, if anybody from industry wants to use this, registration is free and we don't track actually who registered. We only track, I mean, we track them, but we don't, we don't police it. If you register, you register. We don't even need actually any permission. The only permission that we have to, to grant is if you want to access the studio part of it, basically to modify things, right? But that's also free. Now, university versus industry, absolutely, you know, we welcome anybody because really one of the key things is trying to actually encourage industry, university and industry collaboration or at least interaction. And we have some, like I said, in, current, in the current announcements for the fellowship, we have some applications coming from an industry person who wants to develop some teaching material so yeah, by all means, actually it makes the exercise richer in my mind. Awesome. Yeah, yeah and um, I just, I'll, I'll use my, my privileges as the host to just emphasize one thing that Imad said very quickly there. Um, so there's, there's a level at which you can simply log in and you can access this, right? All of the students in your class could generate logins. They can use this material. Um, if you wanna be a HydroLearn developer, there's another portal in the background that lets you create your own modules. And that's the sort of work that Belize did to create the module that she shared with us today. Um, so you can be a, 
you can be a consumer of HydroLearn resources. And if you like it, or you think, geez, I wish, it, I wish there was one on topic X because I really love that topic, then you can ask for permission to create your own module. Uh, and cool. that happens in sort of a sandboxed environment. So it's not public while it's under development. Um, yeah, and there's, a, there's a, another case in between those two, Adam, where mm -hmm. if you like what you have there, what you see there, a module, let's say Belize's module or one of the other modules, but you want to modify it. You can, you can also like clone it with the permission, of course, of, of the developer, and it becomes yours and you can modify it the way you want. So, so I could so I could take Belize's module and I could strip out all of the Utah field sites and instead exactly. put in the White River here in Indiana and my students will think that I did wonderful things. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I actually did that to one of our mods as well. I took it and and we moved it to Utah. So it's a great way to still keep it really localized and relevant for your students, but you're not reinventing the wheel every time. Exactly. Very cool. Um, let's see, the other question I saw come in from um, from Molly McAllister uh, was asking about the back end. So is yeah. this, does this run on a Canvas or Blackboard back end? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna infer from that question, it maybe is also asking, you know, my university uses program X. Does that, is that gonna limit what I can do? Or do I have to have Canvas at my university in order mm -hmm. to use this? Yeah, so actually uh, a short answer here is actually how to learn or the the studio part of it, which where you can actually develop things, is built using the edX platform, edX, open edX platform. Um, just from the name, it's an open source, um, basically learning management system and content management system. And it's, it's um, and we did a lot of research, whether we should build our own, whether we should use something that's, that the community has. And we converged on the open edX because it does not really require any licensing in terms of, you, you know, if it's Canvas, you have to have Canvas. If it's Moodle, you have to have Moodle. So, uh, so it's, it's all an open uh, source edX platform. It's really the same platform that uh, if you're familiar with the, the um, online courses that Harvard and MIT and other universities um, offer their online courses, it's, it's, it's the same platform. But it's, we use the open source part of it. And, and, you know, we went and we have a developer, we have two, two developers actually who went into the platform and customized quite a few pieces of it to, you know, to make it conducive for hydrology, you know, how to integrate resources, how to develop learning objectives, all that stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really um, based on edX um, and it does not, you, you don't have to have Canvas or Moodle. That, that's the, the, I think the advantage of it too, right? That you, once you have a resource there, a course there, you can actually add a collaborator. I can add Adam from Indiana University to my course or my module and we both work on it you know we don't have to be in the same university and we don't have to have the same uh, software um, now it, it, just to emphasize you know very quickly that this is not really intended to replace your lms right this is not intended to replace canvas or you know uh, we don't run grades through this or or submission of student work we can but we opted not to because you should still do that in your own lms i believe you can, the way I do it, I link, you know, I go to my LMS, I use Moodle, for example, and I say, work on this project from HydroLearn and submit the, the assignments in my own LMS. This way it's clean and you don't have to abandon your own LMS because, you know, you don't want to do that. And Belize, is that how you're running your courses as well? Yeah, I did the same thing where I would just point them towards the resource. Perfect. Um, so let's see, I saw, then I saw a question come in um, from Hillary McMillan. And so uh, while I'm asking it and then getting responses from the folks on the panel, um, Julia, I wonder if you would be willing to add Hillary so she could unmute herself and uh, in case she has a follow up or wants to offer her opinion as well. Um, so Hillary uh, typed into the chat box for us. Um, let me find this question, sorry. So what are the what are the pros and cons if students at lots of different universities all end up using the same modules and case studies in their classes? Ooh. Is that a question to me or? <laughs> well, that, that's a question to the panel here. So yeah. whoever has a, a knee jerk response and Jay um, or Skylar, you guys could feel free to, to jump in yeah. as well if you've got thoughts. Um, I guess the, the concern here is that people will exchange the solutions and stuff like that, or, or is that where the well, question is coming from? I, 
I think how about more oh well Hillary you're on hi you're on. I just I just joined <laughs> so I could clarify um, I guess I just wondered whether students from different universities would talk to each other they discover everyone just learned the same thing and it just overall cut down the diversity that we were teaching our hydrology students rather than everybody getting the benefits um, of um, different teaching from different professors and different viewpoints yeah, I, I think it's, it's, you know, the intent really here is not really to replace what we all do in our classrooms, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, so it's really to promote the collaboration of development of these resources and sharing them. And eventually everybody uses them the way they want. Uh, like I said, you can use it as is, a piece, small piece that you insert in your class if it helps. Um, uh, we are actually moving towards more that model of developing smaller, smaller modules that people can insert in their courses. It's not an intention here to replace the entire course and the, student, the, the professor sits uh, on the side. So, um, yeah. I, something to add, I, my experience so far has been that because I'm sort of adapting from others and then building on it, you basically get this crowdsourced product that's superior that the students are receiving and they're probably not many students are going to receive just you know pull it off the shelf and just provide it or just have it as it was developed by another faculty member so i think you really get the benefit of a better product for the student and then you can continue to tweak it so then at least as a faculty member you know that it's not exactly the same as what another class is getting if that's important Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree with the not reinventing the wheel is such a big um, advantage. But I, I guess I already use quite a lot of um, information and activities off the CERC uh, website. And I almost feel the need to check with my hydrology colleagues in different departments in our university that they're not using the same activities. Otherwise, I think students might be like, oh, hang on, I've already seen this activity in my other class. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, there's I mean, it, it strikes me that there's some concern if we lack the personal interaction with our students and, uh, and are explaining it to them. Um, but what's also really appealing to me is, uh, you know, I saw a module that's either developed or in development on culvert hydraulics. And I am positive that culvert hydraulics has been covered in open channel hydraulics. And I've taken that class twice. And I can't tell you much about it off the top of my head. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I, I, I oscillate between these two points, right? So what, what strikes me as optimal would be uh, maybe as a community goal, you know, that there would be some fundamental topics that would be really well explained. Um, and then that would leave instructors to focus on the nuances um, or the unintuitive pieces um, where you know, there, there are some fundamentals that simply are. Right. So what could I pick on here? Um, let's pick on, I don't know. Green amped infiltration method. Yeah, green it. amped infiltration, which is a pretty standard thing. And it's not really the cutting edge of how we think about infiltration, but it's a necessary piece to instruct, you know, and, and in that case, maybe convergence could be really good um, because it's a really I well. I appreciated it a lot when I didn't, I taught it my first year. And I like pulled together a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and had this horrible clunky module. And then the next year is basically, you know, you're teaching it, you're teaching the same material, but I used what Dave Tarbotten and Ahmad had pulled together. And it was just all in one place. The resources were available and the students liked it so much more than my initial approach. And it was so much less work. And that was an example where then I could focus on, you know, other aspects that were more interesting or needed more direct attention. I also like to, if you need to go back in a couple of years, you get a new job or you're in a new role and you say, how the heck did I do that again? You don't have to find the PDF or find the physical handout somewhere. You can go, you know, it's centralized, it's permanent. You can go find that resource again and refresh yourself on it. So um, we have about 10 minutes left in our discussion. I'll just remind all of our attendees that you're quite welcome to um, submit a question in the chat box. And uh, we may just add you so you can add, um, be part of the discussion like we did with Hillary. Um, so in the meantime, uh, as we see if any other questions exist out there. Uh, so I wanted to note that um, 
one of our panelists, uh, Skylar Herzog. Um, so Skylar did a survey of um, faculty, sort of just as this transition to online learning was occurring. Um, and so according to Skylar's results, uh, this is a, a text he sent me during this, uh, <laughs> during this seminar here, um, about half of his respondents who are instructors are aware of educational resources. And that included things like HydroLearn, uh, CERC, Quasi's data-driven education, uh, but less than 10% of faculty actually use them. Um, so we've got this gap between awareness that these kinds of resources exist and actual implementation. Um, and so I wondered if, just to totally put you on the spot, Jay, if I could ask, you know, what, what do you think is, is that barrier between awareness and implementation? Um, how do we get past that? And folks from the audience, if you have thoughts, um, type them in the chat box as to, you know, what, what takes you from awareness to using uh, and how do we lower that bar when we think about community resources like HydroLearn and more? Uh, wow, Adam, I uh, wish I knew because that's a bar that I usually don't get over uh, every time I, I come up to a new class. I usually can only get maybe, so if I was to like look at Belize's module, that would be a significant time investment before I gained enough trust that I could implement it in my class. So I think a lot of the main barriers is like, do I feel confident enough? Do I, um, do I trust this? before I use it in my class. And that's just a, that just trust always takes a long time. Um, so well, I think that's the main barrier is just a lack of time for us to adapt and integrate new things. So, so stepwise bringing in one or two new things each semester, I think is a realistic goal for everybody. My question, maybe another, it raises another barrier is, is if I invest all that time and I develop trust in using one of these shared teaching how stable is it going forward? Am I going to be able to use it again next year and the year after and the year after? Um, or am I just going to adapt to this new technology, this new module, and then it's going to evaporate? So stability is part of the trust issue that um, I'm mentioning. So could they speak a bit about uh, HydroLearn stability going forward? Well, that's, Imad, that's probably a question uh, coming your way about sustainability of the platform. I thought I was done with my question. <laughs> no, this is a great question. And uh, actually, when we wrote uh, about the, the adoption, right, what gets people to adopt, and also the point that Jay raised about the sustainability, when we wrote the, our third proposal, this last proposal of NSF, it, was, it is focused actually on that. It's focused on how do you increase the adoption and uh, how do you address the sustainability. Um, these are very great questions. They are, there's a lot of research on that. You know, there's a whole theory on uh, in, increasing the adoption of innovations in education. And they define certain attributes of what your innovation, right? Innovation here is basically what you are developing that can facilitate adoption. One of them is sustainability, of course, right? And another one is compatibility, compatibility, whether it's compatible with what you do, right? You may have the best resource, but it's not really compatible with what the user wants. Uh, complexity of the use. So there are, you know, how complex, how, how easy it is to use and, and all that stuff. So uh, the more you address these things and, um, you know, uh, people promote the idea of iterative development, don't develop and then put it out there for people to use it. That's a bad model, right? Develop a little bit put it out there, get people to use it, engage them, and then improve and get user feedback as you, as you go. And I think that's why we built this fellowship, module, fellowship program into our project, is basically, to, basically to, to have that continuous improvement model within the development. Sustainability is a big question, Jay, right? I actually participated in a program funded by NSF called the i -Core for Learning, Innovation Core for Learning. Uh, they have it for other uh, disciplines, but I participated in the learning one. And it's all about researching your sustainability uh, model, right? Uh, who are the users and who's willing to pay for this, right? One day, you know, the NSF funding will end and, you know, uh, how do you pay? So um, I think Quasi can play a major role here in, the, in, in providing long-term sustainability for this. Our community, unfortunately, is fairly small. If you start charging for these things, you know, on a on a recurring basis, like statics books, for example, in engineering, or you know, we don't have the market, right? 
Um, so uh, I get it, will, it will take some innovative thinking from the community to, to support the long-term sustainability of, of uh, these things. So far, we have been living or we have been supporting this with NSF support. Um, hopefully, if these things grow enough to have buy-in from the community, the community will be willing to, to sustain it on, its, on their own. So um, I'll stop here if some others have, uh, have had more, more thoughts. Well, so Ahmad, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I do want to be respectful of folks' time, um, but I do want to ask you to talk about one last thing. Um, so I just posted over in the chat box a link to the HydroLearn site um, where you've got the call for um, fellows and for the virtual hackathon that you've got planned this summer. Yes. Um, and I noticed that those closed today, so everybody can now log off of this call and could uh, log in and flood you with applications. Um, could you talk just a bit about what you've got planned for this summer and how people should get engaged? Right. So the last, uh, the last round of fellowships that we did, uh, including Belize, every person will work on these individually. Um, and then uh, uh, we have like biweekly calls with them to guide the fellows. So we wanted to do it differently this, semester, this summer where we have a hackathon type, type event for about a week and a half where people get together um, maybe uh, during certain hours of the day, like a morning check-in and afternoon check-in, and the rest of the day you'll be developing the module uh, virtually, of course, everything is virtually. Uh, but the idea is to pair people together also, right? So for example, Adam and Jay have a great idea for a certain topic that they want to develop a module on. Uh, we'll have them working together to develop that module. Uh, this way you get the best of both minds and also um, uh, Adam will develop something knowing that somebody else is going to use it, right? So this is just, it's not just for me. So that's the idea of the hackathon of, of bringing people together to develop uh, the resources collaboratively. Um, it's, it's, it's about a week and a half or two weeks, but it's not a full two weeks where you have to be booked. It's, it's mostly, like I said, some asynchronous time and some synchronous time. We still have, I mean, we received a lot of applications. I'm very excited about it, actually. Uh, we, we, it, it closes today, you know, uh, it will leave it open if you, if you are really interested, you know, put an application and then we'll definitely um, uh, take it into account. Awesome. Um, all right. Any, any parting questions from anyone out there and any final thoughts from any of our panelists that you want to share? All right, folks. Well, I wanted to just to thank our panel uh, one last time um, and remind you all that uh, this, this workshop today, so what Imad and Belize worked through and the Q&A um, is recorded and Quasi will make that posted. So uh, in perpetuity, you can see our smiling faces. Um, and uh, we will be back uh, having another community sort of meeting and workshop next week, um, 12 to 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and our topic next week will actually will be a graduate student panel. And so uh, Skylar and I will do our best to MC that discussion and we'll have a panel of um, about five grad students to talk to us about both how coursework and working with their PIs and mentors is going uh, in this new reality that we find ourselves in. Um, we'll be soliciting questions to ask that panel um, over social media on Twitter. Uh, and of course, you'll be able to ask them questions live uh, during the meeting. So next week for graduate students and the following week will be uh, more undergraduate focused. And uh, yeah, so we'll look forward to seeing you all back here um, for two more weeks where we can learn what's actually going on in the minds of our students. Uh, oh, and Misty says, thank you for the hard work on this and sharing it with us today. Uh, Imad and Belize, you guys deserve all the credit for this HydroLearn work that we saw. So um, thanks for that. Attendees, thanks for being here. And uh, we'll see you in about a week, everyone. Thank you.